And so, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's uh, NUG community call um, featuring during grads at Nurse uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, this month is Graduate Student Appreciation Month. And so we have a number of different uh, topics we're gonna just discuss today. Uh, getting started, we wanted to make sure everyone was aware about the Nurse Summer Internships that are available. And we have a list of uh, projects that are available and you can easily get to this by simply going to the nurse website and clicking on about and work at nurse. And you can go to summer internships. And we have a list of various projects that are still open and still actively looking for interns. So if you can click on the projects, you can read about those and find one that interests you, and then you'll want to apply for a CSA summer researcher position. But another thing to keep in mind is that nurse, we do hire interns, not just in the summer, but year round. So there could be an opportunity for you to uh, work fall or spring as an intern if you're not available for the summer. But uh, starting with the summer projects and applying is a good way to start. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our session today, and we'll have Eric Palmer, who is a integration engineer here at NURSE, that will walk us through a good little tutorial and fun game of helping you understand the best way to submit tickets so that we can help you. <clears throat> all right. So let me press all the buttons. And then get the thing going. Let's see, presentation mode. I lost it, slideshow, okay. And this one. All right, does that look okay? Looks good. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Charles. Thanks for inviting me to speak here. Um, today, as Charles mentioned, I'm gonna talk about how to submit a good help ticket. Um, my name is Eric Palmer. I'm a software integration engineer with the Programming Environments and Models Group here at NERSC. Um, before I get into tickets, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So uh, I started as a, you know, I started doing consulting at NERSC um, in June 2022. That's when I also first started at NERSC. Um, I've been doing it ever since then. Um, I think, you know, that puts me... I'm gonna guess there are over 200 something tickets probably by now have been answered. Uh, I first came to the Berkeley lab in 2017 as a summer intern with the uh, National Scientific Foundation's Mathematical Student Graduate Internship Program, the NSF MSGI thing. And, and there I started with the Center for Computational Science and Engineering. And if anybody's heard of AMRX, that's kind of their big thing there. Um, uh, the two quick things about myself, I grew up in Berkeley, uh, but now I work remote from Michigan. So that's why you have these two pictures. There's my school ID and, and the snow in the corners, how I feel after moving out of California to Michigan. And the, and the little dots in the corner is actually MFIX, and that's from uh, the internship, the project I was working on when I was there. So um, all this is to really say I've been at NERSC for a while. I've been working in the, uh, as a HPC consultant for a long time. So um, if you want to ask my opinion about tickets, I have plenty of experience to draw from. So uh, what we're going to talk about today in this section is we're going to do uh, ticket myths versus ticket facts, maybe some common, uh, you know, some common issues for tickets. Uh, we're going to do ticket do's and don'ts for filing a good ticket. I, you know, personally, I don't like to say do and don't, uh, but, you know, this one way to kind of get a flavor for what might be uh, a better example to follow. Uh, overall, like, please stop me in the middle if you have any questions uh, to chat about more. Like I said, I can kind of like go on a curve on any tangent on any of this stuff at any moment's notice. So don't feel bad about interrupting it and, and taking it your way. Um, and these, you know, these kind of examples, these two question examples at the bottom really apply to tickets in general. Like, don't assume you're the only person who has a question and therefore you're not answering. So uh, I can tell you right now that the moral of the story of all these slide decks is the, 
the, the worst ticket is the one you don't send. <laughs> so just, uh, you know, err on the side of, of sending too much uh, than too little. So the first, how are we going to start this with some ticket trivia? Uh, this is the myth versus fact. So, oh wait, sorry. Two trivia questions first. So uh, about how many consultants does Nurse have? And I'll, and I'll let maybe the attendees guess first. Um, you can just turn your mic off and shout or type in the chat if you want. Um, and if nobody types or shouts, then I'll let the, the staff also guess because I don't think they might not know either. And meanwhile, I'll look for the chat. Where is the chat? <laughs> Let's see, did anybody guess it? Uh, chat, there's a chat. A, B, C, D. All right, the staff is now allowed to play. What do you guess? Yeah, I actually don't know this one for sure, but I think it's B. 20, okay. All right, uh, going once, going twice. It is not B, unfortunately. It is C. Um, the closest number is 40. So my, by my count, there was 37, which could be a little bit off. Um, but NERSC as a whole has about 135 staff. So you can see, you know, this, um, you know, a small percentage of us that actually do the, the consulting uh, in general. Uh, but a wealth of people we draw knowledge from. Okay, how long should it take a consultant to reply to your question? So this is sort of like, what's the maximum amount of time you should have to wait before you hear back? Uh, I'll give I'll give the attendees a head start for A, B, C, or D. Can't see me checking my watch. <laughs> Okay, so some of the staff should know this. This one's a little bit more obvious, but some people might not know it right away. Anybody who doesn't actually, wasn't actually told what this is, want to guess? Including staff? I hope staff know this. If they don't, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, since I don't want anybody to lose their job, <laughs> The answer is C. <laughs> All right, so in general, uh, when a ticket new ticket comes in, we try to get back to you uh, within four hours or less. I would say in general, it, it's usually quite a bit less than four hours, but um, that is the, the maximum we strive to be under. Uh, the only thing to point out about this is these are business hours. So, you know, this is between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if you send a ticket in the middle of the night, uh, we might not wake up and, and answer it right away. So. Okay. All right. So the next few slides are sort of fact, uh, myth versus fact about uh, help tickets at NERSC. And uh, the first myth is that nurse consultants do not like answering tickets. And this is, you know, this is not true, right? The fact is that many of us work at NERSC uh, and especially in the consultant role because we like helping people solve their problems. Um, you know, especially technical problems are lots of fun. Uh, what I like to tell people is I like your problems much better than my problems. <laughs> so as I don't want to solve my problems, I would prefer to solve your problems. So, you know, write in and tell us about what's going on so that we can be helpful. Uh, the second myth is I should not submit a ticket because my question problems are stupid or and only experts sh should submit tickets. So, uh, my kind of personal take on this is I always feel like due diligence, like you sh you know, I should have to do my due diligence before I submit a ticket. And my due diligence expands from like five minutes checking to 10 minutes to checking to like two hours checking to like four hours, six hours, eight hour day checking, right? And that's, you know, I think that's a bit much. So uh, I wouldn't say it's not even questions that are stupid. It's even questions or problems that you think somebody else could answer in five minutes that is like, why am I asking this? So the reality is, um, you know, all users can and should submit tickets, 
And even if your question is something that, you know, maybe somebody else could figure out in five or 10 minutes, just because you didn't, doesn't mean it's not a good question. And uh, I think the quote to go with this one is, my job is too easy, said no one ever. So if you send in a help ticket and I can answer it in five minutes, I will happily do so and be appreciative that I was actually able to help somebody easily. Um, I don't need to have every ticket take me weeks to figure out the solution to. So um, please write in with your tickets. Let me help you get moving faster and get back to your science. This falls into the stuff I was just talking about, the myth I need to spend days stuck on a problem before I file a ticket. And this goes the same thing. Sometimes, um, you know, nurse staff, we answer lots of tickets. It's just easier for us to remember, like, what was the answer to a similar question? You know, we spend 24-7 doing this. Sometimes we can just point you to the docs where it's already there and save you hours because, you know, something was just called something slightly different or something. I mean, you, you, everyone here grew up on the internet. You know how it goes. <laughs> you Google the wrong thing, it'll take forever. So sometimes you just need to talk to a real person. So so please reach out. Don't wait till you're stuck. Don't spend days being stuck. You know, to be honest, if I had to pick a number, I would say something closer to like 30 minutes or an hour before you send a help ticket in. Hmm. So another myth, I need to attach all relevant files to the ticket and service now. So um, again, this is not true. Why is this not true? Uh, consultants have the power to impersonate users on our system. So for example, like you log in and it says like you're um, somebody else one, two, three. If I need to go in and pretend to be somebody else one, two, three uh, to access the files or to recreate the error that you're seeing, I, I can do that. I will tell you, uh, my personal opinion is I try to do this as sparingly or as little as possible. So we will ask you to to do you know to to transmit files and provide information as much as you can, um, just because you know I don't think you want other people going through uh, your files and things. Um, yeah, you it, it's it's better if you take care of it yourself. <laughs> just leave it at that. <laughs> so, um, but we can if we need to. So don't don't let that prevent you from writing tickets or or asking for help. So here are some troubleshooting tips. Um, the basic rule between the difference between like bad ticket and good ticket is going to be like the kind of information you can provide with your ticket, right? So on, on the first ticket, you provide a lot of helpful information, um, then we can probably answer it much more quickly, right? Uh, you know, this, we'll go through some examples later about what information in particular is the most useful. Um, but that's kind of the moral of the story. So here are some things that you can check uh, when you file a ticket that maybe could potentially answer some, some common uh, ticket scenarios that we have. Um, sometimes you're like, uh, you know, it's a common ticket is I can't log in, you know, and password's not working. Uh, well, checking the nurse live status might tell you something that like the Perlmutter system is down for maintenance today. And then you say, oh, it's down for maintenance. It's not my fault. And there's nothing I can do except for wait. The nurse life status will also tell you when Pearl Metal will come back. So you, you know, it may not be that it's your password that is a problem. It's just that the system is down and it will come back shortly. So, uh, so that nurse life status link can be helpful. Um, it's also commonly referred to as the MOTD uh, message of the day. So if you hear people on the nurse user Slack talking about MOTD, that's what they're talking about. And since we're talking about uh, Slack. We do have a user Slack uh, instance uh, for nurse users. And this is also a good place to ask questions like, oh, you know, I'm experiencing this on the system. Is anybody else seeing this? Um, then people are usually pretty friendly and responding. Um, there's also some people there who have been at NERSC much, much longer than I have, and they know fancy tricks. So if you make friends there, you might learn lots of cool stuff. Um, there's also some other commands that can be useful. One of them is show quota, just to see if you're running out of space. So sometimes you have uh, file writing problems. Uh, you know, you're in the middle of your code and it's you can't figure out why the file won't write. It's dying in the middle. It's possible that you're just out of space in your quota. And a command like show quota will tell you that. And then you can write to us and say, please give me more quota. I need it for all the amazing science I'm doing. And this is why. And we'll read it and we'll say, okay, cool, 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 cool. So. Um, 
A few other things, uh, Iris is sort of the account management uh, website where you can look into your account and get lots of information. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, like it says, do you, is your account current? Do you have compute hours? You can see whether your account has been disabled for some reason, which is pretty uncommon. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, what are some other good things to pull out of Iris? Uh, but the point is, is, is Iris will tell you like how many times your password has been reset. But, like we keep a lot of information in that account uh, uh, as far as like your your account status. So if you poke around in there, you'll find a lot of useful information. Um, so another common issue for users is dot .files. So in, and really this is, I think more and more about environment customizations. So sometimes people put sort of automatic environment customizations into their, uh, you know, into their shell or so when they log in, it makes some changes as they come in. Well, anytime you take your sort of user environment and you make it different, it could potentially lead to problems when you're trying to do software installs or, or something's not quite working. Um, so kind of knowing exactly what you did to the, the environment and how it's affecting things, it, it can be helpful. And so those automatic changes are usually stored in .bash RC or .bash profile, and that's why these things are called .dot files. But you know that can also apply to things like, um, you know, if you automatically load a Python environment when you log in or something like that. Sometimes those can can cause inter interactions that cause problems. So, um, but to be, to be honest, I, I think I see less and less of that these days. Um, but it's still something to watch out for. Uh, we do have a search bar in our docs. It would, I think we should call it the new and improved search bar. Like, so, you know, if you're first coming to NERSC, then, then maybe uh, you haven't experienced this, but if you haven't used a search bar in a couple of years because you heard it wasn't good, or if you hear people saying that search in the docs is bad, uh, I would say that the new search bar does a much better job. It's been revamped, made fancy, and works better. Um, there's plenty of other ways to search the docs too, which also work well, um, which I have too many to go into here, but, but I recommend all those. And, you know, again, like it shouldn't take you too long, kind of like going through these things and looking at them, depending on what your problem is, but don't wait too long before you submit a ticket. So. Okay. Now the, the do's and don'ts for submitting a good ticket. So this just to see some contrasting examples. So do be specific so for example if you say something like my code is slow it's hard for us to kind of like troubleshoot that with that kind of information if you instead were to say something like job id one two three four five six seven like this is going to be a common theme giving us the job ids uh, was three times slower than another job id then that's a much more specific thing that we can drill down and, and investigate uh into uh investigate much better with our with our tools um, if you write to us and say, my job is slow, that's okay. What we'll do is we'll write back and you say, well, could you please be a little bit more specific about which job you're talking about and what kind of slowness you noticed. Um, another one that's hard is my job won't start. Again, a way to improve on this is to provide more detailed information, such as the job script loaded at pound home slash submit job sh works on Corey. Oh, I was supposed to edit that out. Um, <laughs> Cori is our old system, which is no longer here, but you could say, it, it, you know, maybe it was working two weeks ago, but it's not working now. Um, that gives us sort of like a, a, a place to start with the job script. Again, common information to apply uh, to include in your message is the job script. Uh, hard to troubleshoot. Perl model is broken. I know these sound unbelievable, but yes, we at all three of these examples, people have sent in tickets, but they literally just say, those three words. Um, we can be much more helpful if there's a ticket that says something like, you know, running Python on scratch and this script crashes with the error message provided. So, so far you've got three examples here. You've got job numbers, job script, and error messages. So that th those are some of the key uh, pieces of information that can really be useful for us when we're trying to help you. So <laughs> don't, uh, don't just paste your message without any context. Again, I know these sound maybe strange, but, but these are all things that people have seen before. Um, 
you know, like, like, like I said, you know, if this happens, it's not a big deal. We'll just I'll question them right back and we'll say, well, can you explain a little bit more about the context and what you're trying to do so that we can better help you? Um, you know, steps to recreate the error that can be very helpful. You know, if you're talking about a very involved process, uh, it might be more easier to first tell us about what's going on, provide a brief context, and then we'll come back and ask more specific questions. So, you know, I wouldn't say you have to show us like, <laughs> you know, you don't have to say, I started graduate school in 2020 and then I took math and now I'm trying to solve this problem. Like that would be too much information and too many steps in the process, right? So um, anyways, but the context for these error messages things definitely helps. Uh, do show your work. So that's again, explaining the steps about how you got to where you got or where you got the errors. Um, I'm not going to read all of these things, but again, it falls under the same general uh, description of we basically want to be able to recreate the error ourselves. So if you, you know, if there's not enough information for me as a consultant to do that, um, then then I will have to write back and ask. And, you know, the more back and forth, the, the longer it takes to get things done. Okay. So... Um, yeah, these, you know, if you knock off everything on this list, then, then you'd be like this A plus ticket response, right? So, okay. So now we're on the, the now you try to evaluate the ticket section. And, and so here it goes, right? So, so this is the quiz with, with real user tickets. So you get to say whether they're good or bad and maybe what's wrong with them. Um, Again, real examples. I can't log into Perlmutter. It's broken. Please fix it. How could this have been made better? Right. Did we say this? Okay. We really need more information to troubleshoot this. So the first thing we're going to do is write back and, and talk about this. Um, Charles, I see we're getting close to about 1.30. You want to go through one more example or... We'll do one more because we have this another GIF here. Yeah. Okay. We're not. <laughs> uh, this is somebody writing in about QPy. They're saying it doesn't work on Perlmutter. Um, I'm trying to run this Python program. I get an error message when I import QPy. I think QPy is broken on Perlmutter. Can you please reinstall it? You see this error message. They shared it. Um, what do we think about this one? Oh, I didn't see. There were actually answers in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. They're behind. OK. We like this. Yes, no, thumbs down, thumbs up. I think this one is a good example of, uh, I think this is already pretty good, you know? I know what you're talking about. You're talking about Python. You said you were trying to import QPy and you, you provided an error message. This gives me a lot to work on already. Um, maybe there's some more information as to what this user could have been, uh, added. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not seeing what it is. Hmm. You know, I, I think the only thing would be some more steps leading up to this and some more context, right, about what you're trying to do. Um, with that, I'm going to... What did the guy say? Thank you, that message. Okay. Oh, this is an example. They're trying to say, like, what sort of job they were using in cause the error message. Again, context for what they're doing. Okay. Um, so the last slide, the too long didn't read is our job is to, as a like HPC consultant is really to help you get back to your science as fast as possible. So any question, beginner questions are definitely welcome. Don't spend days and days stuck on something, you know, write to me so we can be stuck together. Uh, maybe we won't, maybe I'll be able to solve your problem quickly, right? Uh, when you submit a ticket, as if you can add some specifics and context about what you're doing, that will help us help you much faster. Um, providing the steps so that we can reproduce the error so that we can fix it and verify it's fixed before we tell you that it's fixed <laughs> or tell you it's a solution is, is usually very helpful. Um, you know, this one line about providing text versus screenshots, this is, I would say, personally, I'm not really against screenshots. I'd rather have screenshots than no explanation whatsoever. So plain text is better. Screenshots are okay. Um, but 
context in any form is most helpful. So as it says here, if you can give us informa information up front, then we can do your solve your problems more quickly. And then you can get back to doing science and getting all the degrees and accolades that you want. So um, with that, that's the end of my presentation. So hand it back to you, Charles. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, one last question before you leave. What's your favorite part about being a consultant? Uh, it's, I'm a, I get obsessive over problems. So people give me problems and I just keep thinking about them until they're done. I'm really happy when I can actually solve one. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes weeks, but it's nice when you can actually help somebody. So that's a big motivation for me. Yeah. Helping others always help makes you feel better. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, did anyone have any questions for Eric? Okay. All right. Well, we are going to continue on um, with our next speaker. Uh, Anthony, how are you doing? Chat, Charles. There's a question in chat. Okay. For a complete beginner grad student, is there a good resource such as office hours for getting started? Yes. It would be great, jo jo Joanne, if you could come to office hours and you can also actually schedule an appointment with a nurse consultant to um, have a one-on-one -on -one office hour as well if you need more hands-on help too. And would someone be able to provide the link to how she can schedule in the chat for me? And we'll, we'll get that link for you so you can schedule it. All right, but we will move on. Um, next up in our program today, we will get to hear an exciting uh, presentation from our Nurse Early, Early Career Award winner. Um, and it'll be Anthony uh, Kremen, who is going to be giving us a, a overview of his research um, on DESI, which is building the largest 3D map of the universe. And DESI stands for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. And so Dr. Anthony Kremen is a project scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he is being honored for his research work in pioneering an approach for process, data processing for DESI and helping to helping the DOE fulfills its mission of building the largest 3D map of the universe. So before joining uh, Berkeley Lab, Anthony was a postdoctoral researcher and he received his PhD from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, so everyone, if you could uh, welcome Anthony to our community call. Anthony, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I hope you're doing well too. Um, wonderful. Um, so we're excited to hear about your research and the work you've done with Desi. So uh, if you, you're free to go ahead and get started and you know you can take questions throughout your presentation or you can wait till the end. Either is up to you. Um, I'm happy to take questions throughout, um, but I maybe won't see messages in chat. So if if people want to shout out, they are welcome to do so. Uh, awesome. I'll ping you if we do and read out the question if, if it one pops up. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Charles, for that perfect introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be here today and happy to tell you a little bit about Desi and my work in helping enable uh, building the largest 3D map of the universe. Uh, I do want to start out by saying that DESI is roughly a thousand person collaboration. And so this is by no means done in a vacuum. And this is the work I'm presenting on behalf of many other individuals as well. Um, so to give people some context of why we might want to build the largest 3D map of the universe, uh, it all comes back to cosmology and some open questions that we have that we want to understand using the scientific method. So uh, right now, as we understand it, there seems to have been sort of a hot big bang that happened about 13.8 billion years ago. And afterward, the universe was very hot and dense, and it slowly expanded. And as it expanded, it cooled and first atoms formed and then stars formed and then galaxies formed and on and on until we basically reached the modern era. Um, 
But recent observations have noticed that there are several kind of intriguing things that we don't see here on Earth, one of which is dark matter, which seems to be invisible matter, which is gravitationally attracting things, but we can't see it. And the other is dark energy, which is actually causing the universe to expand at a faster rate. It's almost an anti-gravitational attract. It's an it's a gravitational repulsion rather than a gravitational attraction. And so um, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, as the name implies, is going after this dark energy, which um, is been known for at least 25 years, but we still have very little understanding of what physics dictates it. DESI's primary science goals are to measure baryon acoustic oscillations. And what those are is in the very early universe, it was a hot, dense plasma, but there were certain areas that were denser than others. And those dense areas attracted gravitationally nearby matter. And as the nearby matter came in, that local area heat became even hotter because the hot thing became more dense and you know, everything was closer together and the heat from that caused an outward pressure. And so there was this kind of pull and push going on and that created these outward ripples that are shown in this 2D illustration on, on the left here. And so these ripples moved out from these over densities uh, roughly at the speed of sound in the plasma in the early universe. And they basically continued moving outward until what's called recombination. And recombination is when the universe expanded enough, it thinned out, and when it thinned out, light was able to escape, and that allowed the plasma to cool effectively for the first time, and it allowed the photons to fly away without immediately interacting with nearby matter. And so what that meant is any matter that was being pushed in this wave suddenly stopped being pushed, and it kind of sat there. And so if you imagine this ring in three dimensions, that becomes a shell. And so we have these bubbles or shells that exist and are frozen in time um, at a specific characteristic distance. And so that distance, if you do the math based on some fundamental physics properties, uh, turns out to be about 150 megaparsecs. Um, and so basically all you need to know is we have uh, a reasonable understanding from fundamental physics that we should expect to see rings or bubbles in the clustering of matter in the universe because of this early, early um, oscillations. And so DESI wants to basically look at galaxies in the universe and see if we can see statistically if there are over densities at these distances. Uh, and so what we do is we look out and we can measure, statistically speaking, whether galaxies preferentially are spaced apart at a certain distance um, transversely, so across the sky, or whether they're preferentially spaced uh, along the line of sight, so one being in front of another. And so we can do both of these measurements simultaneously by looking at the three-dimensional map and then statistically, we hope to be able to see that the universe prefers to cluster on these scales, that there are over densities and shells uh, set up in this manner. And we can do that at multiple distances because the speed of light is finite. And so as we look further away, we look back further in time. And so not only can we measure whether this clustering is happening now, but we can also measure it in the past. And not only can we measure whether it exists, but we can measure the amount of it. And basically by using these things as standard rulers, because from fundamental physics principles, we know how big it should be. We can actually use that to measure how big the universe actually is. And that determines, um, or that tells us about the cosmological evolution of the universe. That tells us about fundamental things, including dark energy. Um, so DESI is going to build this map using several different types of tracers. Um, we call these galaxies tracers. Um, and so we have a nearby sample called the Bright Galaxy Survey. We're going to measure 13.5 million of these galaxies, and they're in the sort of nearby universe. 
And then we'll move further out and measure 8 million galaxies that we call luminous red galaxies. Further out yet, we would measure 16 million emission line galaxies. And then even further, we measure very bright, um, basically active black holes that emit uh, called quasars. And we measure the light that they emit and determine where they are in three-dimensional space. And so overall, we're going to measure 40 million galaxies and create this three-dimensional map. And so this is enabled by getting a very large telescope. We have a four-meter telescope located at Kitt Peak in Arizona. Uh, we have a, a wide field corrector that allows us to view a lot, a large patch of sky at any given time. Uh, this is eight square degrees is significantly bigger than a lot of uh, professional astronomy telescopes that uh, you may have heard of. We also use robotic fiber positioners in order to move optical fibers to different points on the sky in order to capture the light from the galaxy. And this is what's really revolutionized our instrument compared to previous generations is the ability to reconfigure within a minute or two, as opposed to taking hours to reconfigure where the fiber optic cables are placed. And this is also everything feeds into 10 different multi-object spectrographs. Um, so it's it's quite a large instrument. So these, these robotic positioners, as I said, are kind of what makes STESI unique. Um, they can rotate in a circle, and they can also extend and retract. And so they can reach anywhere within a circular patrol radius. They can overlap with one another to get galaxies that are very close by to one another. And each of them holds an optical fiber, which is roughly the width of a human hair. It's about 100 microns across, I believe. And so it's a very small thing. It positions it to a few micron precision in order to capture the light very accurately from a given galaxy that's invisible to the naked eye on the sky. And the light from that is captured by one of these fiber optic cables, and it's fed into one of 10 spectrographs. Each spectrograph actually has three different cameras, three different channels in the near infrared, optical, and, and near uh, UV uh, spanning from 360 to 980 nanometers. And then the job of the spectroscopic pipeline is obviously to turn these raw images of 500 spectra each run it through a bunch of algorithms and output astronomical results. As you see on the bottom left, that's a that's a nice quasar, which is one of these active uh, black holes in the very distant, distant uh, universe. And so the data from DESI has been excellent. We've been running for three and a half years. Uh, the data quality has been very good and we've been very happy with things. Um, in general, it's not quite as good as what I just showed because a lot of the galaxies we're looking at are incredibly faint, actually. And so this is what a more typical spectrum might look like. This is a galaxy at a redshift 1.4, which is, I forget, it might be 8 billion years look back time in the universe. Um, but if you actually zoom in on a specific wavelength range, you will see that we can actually uh, determine this oxygen 2 doublet to very high precision. And so this is enough signal to noise for us to actually determine where this object uh, should be by comparing its rest frame wavelength that we know oxygen two emits at to where we observe it. And the redshift between the two determines basically how far away we are due to cosmological expansion. So DESI has been running for three years now uh, in its main survey. And so this is showing you uh, how we've been acquiring the bright time tiles for the main survey. And so each one of these is 5,000 objects being scanned, um, each circle. And then as, as we do more and more coverage, uh, the circles get closer to complete. We want, we're running five passes on every point of sky. Um, or sorry, we're running five passes across the sky, each point on the sky will receive between three and four passes total, uh, three and four opportunities to, to receive a fiber. And the dark survey is doing seven passes so that each point in the sky receives at least five opportunities to be observed. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's kind of a hypnotic 
march across the sky that we that we do filling in. And so actually after three years, we were 73% done with the bright time and 67% done with the dark time. So both of those exceeded the expectations of 60% uh, for our five-year survey. And so we're, we're very happy with the progress we've been making. And so this is kind of where I and the DESI data team step in, which is how do we take all of this data that's being accumulated the tens of millions of objects we've already acquired and process that data. Uh, and the short answer is we use NERSC <laughs> because we need a lot of compute. Um, and so we, we do two different types of processing. One is the daily processing, which is how we refer to the processing we do each night as the data is being acquired. And we use the information from that processing to um, determine whether the quality of the data from the previous night is good enough for our scientific needs. If it's not, we will either take more data or we might even uh, replace some of the data that we took the night before if we deem it to be inadequate or, or faulty in some way. And then we also do large reprocessing campaigns where we'll reprocess all one year or all three years of data simultaneously with a single set of algorithms that are tagged pieces of code uh, for reproducible scientific papers. And so we do we use the same pipeline for both of these both of these uh, modes. Um, the only real difference is that daily is reactionary to new things coming in in real time. and so it doesn't have a full picture of what it's going to be processing. Whereas when we reprocess we're, our algorithms can be a little bit more clever and optimized because we know all of the data we're ever going to have. And so we can, we can just be a little more clever with that. So the workflow basically works like this. Um, so on the bottom left here, we take the data, it's stored locally at the mountain, and then roughly every minute we transfer it into NERSC. From there, we have jobs that run via the Scron, um, scron table and those wake up and if they see new data they submit them for processing in some way that process data then sits at NERSC and uh, an end user can then monitor and assess that data and so for the daily pipeline we, we use a special queue that NERSC offers called the real-time queue so we have several nodes that are uh, promised to be available to us at almost all times at least when when Perlmutter is operating. And um, from that, we can, we can submit these jobs with the knowledge that they will be processed relatively soon after we submit them uh, so that we can, we can assess the data quickly and make sure uh, nothing is going wrong with, with the data coming out the telescope. Uh, so as I said, uh, DESI transfer is the script we use. It works on a data transfer node and it moves the data from the mountain to NERSC. And then we have this manager that wakes up uh, every 20 minutes or so. It sees if there's any new data and it submits MPI enabled jobs to, to the real-time queue uh, in order to be processed. Um, it also handles dependencies. So it's, it's a fully fledged workflow manager. It handles dependencies, it handles uh, failures. If, if a job fails in the queue, it will cancel dependencies and it will manage how to resubmit those later on. Um, and this is what a typical job graph would look like for a night. So we have, we have a first job that is used to calibrate the low level CCDs, uh, the low level cameras, and then all jobs depend on that one because you need to calibrate all of the cameras in order to do anything more sophisticated, uh, and so on. There's various steps that occur, um, but you see there are several bottlenecks and several layers of dependencies that occur before we actually get to the science processing um, here on the bottom. So each of these kind of vertical stripes at the bottom is a different uh, set of 5,000 scientific, uh, 5,000 objects that we were observing uh, to get their distances. And so um, how we actually process each of these is through 
well, it's it's a Python package called Desi Spec, uh, which holds all of the code that we use to do the spectroscopic processing. And Desi Spec um, and the pipeline are MPI enabled, GPU enabled, using MPI for Pi and CuPy. Um, it used to be multi-node jobs, but we've actually been able to uh, synthesize it down into one node, partly because Perlmutter's, Perlmutter's uh, nodes are larger than Corey's were, and also partly because of uh, some efficiency gains we've been able to make. Um, for this audience, I won't go into gory detail about all of the things we do, but needless to say, we, we clean up the raw CCD images, and then we extract each of the individual uh, spectra from the images. And then we clean up those spectra uh, some more to remove things like uh, light emitted from the sky, which has nothing to do with the galaxy behind it, uh, and things like that. And then we also uh, calibrate how calibrate the flux so we know in an absolute sense how bright the object actually was. And for significantly more details, people are welcome to look at a paper led by Julian Guy summarizing these, summarizing the DESI pipeline. Um, this is what a typical timing looks like for one of these nightly processing. So this is from a night last fall. So the top is when the job was submitted. The middle is when the job actually started in the queue. And the bottom is when the job finished. And each each uh, of these vertical lines is a different job that was submitted. And the x-axis here is just time throughout the night, locally at NERSC, I believe. And so um, you can see that all of the jobs that are submitted are basically finished very quickly. And for the vast majority of the science jobs, which are these bluish jobs, they actually complete before the next science exposure is done. And so we are genuinely doing this in real time. By the time the next set of data is acquired, we already have the process results of the previous data that was taken. Um, and so this is this is genuinely real time observations, and this is completely without humans in the loop. It is all automated uh, using a, a vast swath of nurse resources that that are provided to us. And then each morning, uh, scientists within DESI will assess uh, plots like these, which show a lot of detail, uh, more than I'm going to cover here. But it basically just gives us ways of assessing whether or not the observations were valid or not, whether or not the signal to noise is good enough for what we need it to, um, and whether or not uh, there's any sort of hardware or software issues that we might need to look into before we can be happy with the data. And so we're we're actually visually inspecting all of the data before we use it in our scientific analyses. Um, one thing I would have been remiss to uh, not mention is the tight partnership we do have with NERSC and the NERSC staff. Uh, they're very great to us. Uh, and one of the big accomplishments um, is through the NESAP program that we partnered with NERSC, uh, it was probably two or three years ago now. Um, but through the NESAP program, Daniel Margala was able to help us improve the slowest step in our pipeline. And so from the initial implementation and in, into his final implementation on Perlmutter, using GPUs um, and using you know, efficient computational algorithms, he was able to make a 25% improvement. And he turned what was the most computationally intensive, time intensive step into something uh, that's actually now subdominant to several other factors that we now are cleaning up. And so, um, yeah, I, I would highly recommend the NESAP program to anyone who um, needs, needs some additional help uh, getting, getting the most out of Perlmutter. So, Beyond the nightly processing of all of the data, we also do uh, large reprocessing campaigns, as I mentioned. And so thanks to speedups like uh, Daniel's and other work that the rest of the team and I have done, um, we've been able to keep up with this large increase in data volume. 
So the initial data uh, shown here on the right in histogram form was basically a million galaxies, half a million stars, and about 100,000 of these uh, active black holes, quasars. Um, we released this data last year. So it's available to the public. Anyone on this call is welcome to look at our documentation, look at our paper. You can download the data from NERSC um, or from other locations and play around with it if you so choose. Uh, we include raw data, calibrated data. We include multiple of these uh, redshift fits, which are an indicator of distance. And we provide summary catalogs and value-added catalogs with various other information that uh, people in our collaboration have determined useful enough to share with, with others. And since then, since that catalog with about one and a half million objects, we've already processed the year one catalog, which we've just finished uh, doing our scientific analyses on. And so in that one, we have 14 million galaxies, 5 million or 4 million stars, and one and a half million quasars. And so you can see the numbers are already jumping up. We're already a factor of 10 bigger. Uh, and we were able to do this in roughly the same amount of time, thanks to improvements in our automation and improvements in our, in our pipeline performance. We processed this a year later. And in that year, we were able to do enough optimization to make the processing time roughly consistent. Now, I did mention the year one cosmology results. Uh, I will not go into great detail here. Here I show two different YouTube links, one for a general audience, one for a technical audience for people who are interested. Um, some kind of highlights from the year one DESI analysis. Um, we agree with cosmic microwave background measurements for the expansion rate of the universe, the H naught Hubble parameter. Um, and we tend to disagree with some of the local supernova measurements, who, which measure H naught to be larger. Uh, and we also see some interesting hints that maybe dark energy isn't constant with time, but that is uh, still very preliminary. And we, we don't know. It could just be a statistical fluke. Uh, this is showing the Hubble, Hubble uh, constant that I was talking about, this H naught parameter. Uh, this gets a lot of press um, because supernova measurements measure it to be very high, around 73, at least some of them do, uh, whereas we measured it to be much lower, somewhere around 68 and a half, and other probes called the cosmic microwave background measure it even lower than that. And so we tend to agree with cosmic microwave background and less so with, with Hubble. Um, this is showing our data, which shows this dotted line is the one in favor of dark energy evolving with time. This is look back time on the on the vertical or sorry on the horizontal axis. And so our data does slightly prefer evolving dark energy, but um, again, it's it may be a statistical fluctuation. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time and just say that um, we have also finished our third year of data acquisition. And so we're actually up to 30 million galaxies and 11 million stars. Um, and we are preparing to submit a large reprocessing campaign of this year three sample uh, probably next week. And so we are gearing up for yet another sort of, not an order of magnitude, but a factor of several. And we're hoping we can do it in roughly the same amount of time again through some through some more automation. So just to, just to wrap up, I think I'm out of time. So the goals of DESI are ambitious. And so in order to keep up with that, we also had to be very ambitious in our data processing processing goals and our, and our software infrastructure. Uh, so far, the, we've been able to keep up with the increase in data volume, which is more than a factor of 10 over previous uh, surveys of this type. And um, we're hoping that by continuing to push on optimizations, use of GPUs, um, and other human out of the loop automation, we can we can keep up with this deluge without too much um, too much issue. And I do want to emphasize again, NERSC has played a key role in all of this, um, and we do want to thank the staff and everyone there for for all their help in making Desi possible. So with that, I'll take questions.
Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Anthony. I have one question, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe you can speak to if your work will lead towards an understanding of this, but I remember like a couple of headlines last year talking about an idea that maybe miniature black holes are fueling the dark energy expansion. Do you have any additional thoughts on that or? Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, it's, it's a, or did you hear that headline before or? Yes. So, um, so there, there, there are various theories to try and physically motivate and understand what dark energy could be. And I believe that is one of them. Um, but it's, it's something that's very difficult to test experimentally. And so as, as an experimental scientist, I, I tend to be sort of agnostic to these theories. I find them very interesting. And if, and if they, if, no current data rules them out. I am very much uh, in favor of trying to test them to the best we can. Um, but Desi specifically cannot uh, test those theories as far as I can tell. Um, but I, I would have to review those papers again to, to see if there's anything we can actually say to differentiate that from some other type of, of dark energy. Awesome, awesome. I just, it was, something in the back of my head and reading, um, watching your presentation, it just, I just thought I'd ask. So thank you. Did anybody else have any um, questions for Anthony? Oh, I'll wait. Um, hi, Yu Feng. Uh, hi, Anthony, that's a great talk. I'm also part of DESI. So I think my work is a little bit more on IO intensive part. So I wonder, do you have any recommendations, for example, um, accessing the spectra because right now all, all structure all spectra are laid are organized in pedal files. So each pedal file has, like, for example, I think 60 or something like that has like in each pedal. And the issue is that if I want to randomly access each spectra, mm -hmm. each spectrum, so what is a preferable way to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one big tip that's applicable to everyone not in debt, including people who aren't in DESI, is to use the read-only version of the file systems if you're only reading in data and you're not going to be writing out that same file, um, because those are much faster in terms of loading times. Uh, so that would be one recommendation, is make sure you're using the read-only for reading in the spectra. Um, and another one might be if, if you're doing multiple things and you're opening the same file multiple times, I would recommend some sort of caching or aggregating where maybe you temporarily on Perlmutter Scratch uh, save them into like a large HDF5 file or something um, if you're going to be accessing it multiple times. If you're doing it once um, beyond the read only and a few fits IO potentially you could do some fits IO tricks, but beyond that, you maybe just have to bite the bullet and and march through the data one by one. Right. Yeah. I, actually, I, I try to use temporal locality and I wonder from nurse perspective, is there any temporal locality optimization already implemented? Like, because I, I think you mentioned about is uh, DVS forward. So you, you just said the DVS to read only, hopefully the virtual file system is kind of better in a sense. And I also try to do that, but I I I think the temporal locality might help a little bit. So I wonder if, like, if nurse have any kind of temporal locality implemented under the hood for a file, like, I mean, it, 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 is there a cache already implemented or do I have to do it manually? So I, be I believe they do cache files um... So if if you're reaccessing it in a relatively short period of time, I believe it does it is quicker. Uh, I also think the way the Luster file system is set up, um, if I'm not mistaken, things on the same uh, Luster server might be served by the same machine. And so if you're trying to access lots of things, it might actually hurt you. Be if you're trying to access many things that are all from the same server as opposed to multiple, but um, you should probably file a ticket and talk to someone who's more expert at that than than I am. 
Um, and I think actually the read only server is more efficient at that. And so maybe gets around some of those issues I just mentioned. Um, okay. Yeah. This, this might be a great example actually of filing a ticket. <laughs> a ticket, or if you want to book a consultation appointment, that way, if you have like, you want a specific, um, understanding of, um, your IO, how you can more efficiently do your IO data processing than a appropriate data expert can help you. Right, right. So is is it okay for me to uh, like schedule an appointment with some yeah, like use... specific software in, in that case? Because for example, that's is a little bit specific and, and we have some like specific goal. Okay, okay, sure. Probably I'll do that. And I'll give you repost that link for you to schedule too. Yeah. Awesome. Great, um thank you. Let me find that up here. It should be nurse.as.me. Let's say website. And um, Eric, you had a question for Anthony. Anthony has time. Yeah. So um, my question is about the actual executable that gets run by the job scheduler. Do those have like a common name, like Desi dot like this part A, Desi part B, or something? Like, do you know the actual names of the executables that get run by the job schedule? It's a total self-serving question for different purposes, but. <laughs> uh, so our, so the, the scripts we actually submit to, to the Slurm scheduler each have a unique name, um, but in them, they all run the same code called DesiProc, um, which is, which is the code we run under the hood. Um, but each each script name is actually different and the job names are different. Uh, but they follow a template, which I'd be happy to share with you. Um, okay, I can follow up later if uh, if that the Desi proc wasn't enough. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you again, Anthony. Um, really enjoyed your presentation and learning more about your work. And uh, next time I'm at the lab, I'll have to see if I can track you down and grab a cup of coffee and chat. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you everybody for attending today's community call. Um, we'll have our next one next Thursday at 4 p.m. <laughs> and we hope to see you there as well. And tell your friends, we will be trying to get the participation even bigger, so. Have a good one. Thanks, bye everybody. Great.